For as little as $1 per month, you can support independent journalism by supporting Mia Media on Patreon. That's mere pocket change to support quality local content creation. To subscribe, visit patreon.com slash M-I-E-U-M media. Thank you to all paid subscribers for helping to grow Mia Media and for supporting independent journalism. Let's say that you're in the market for a new home and you find a house with a good price that's a bit of a fixer-upper. After some repairs, you then look outward. What to do about the outdoors? You start by planting a nice green lawn. Beautiful. Then you purchase some pest-free shrubs and ornamental flowers from a local store. Now that things are looking pretty good, you want to keep it that way. So you make sure to water your lawn and plants regularly, and generously apply pesticides and herbicides to keep out unwanted weeds and bugs. To many, this seems uncontroversial, or even respectable residential maintenance. But to an increasing number of scientists and experts in the field, you could be doing far more harm than you realize. So what's so bad with our example? Well, first let's start with the lawn. So seeds blow around, dandelion seeds, violet seeds, every kind of seed blows around and wants to grow. And if you have just the slightest open space in your lawn, those seeds will take. So for you to stop that, you have to use either a weed seed inhibitor or what they do in the poison programs is they put down what's called a broadleaf weed killer, which kills everything but a, a monocot, which is a grass. And that just is not right to me. You can't put poisons down like that. So if we have plants that don't support an insect population, the birds can't eat the insects and the whole cycle breaks down. So the, the plants themselves are a part of, a, of an evolution that's been taking place. This is Nancy De Bruyne Clementi, the founder of NatureWorks Horticultural Services, an organic garden center in Northford, Connecticut. Lawns are the largest irrigated crop in the United States even more prevalent than wheat or corn. Lawn care also accounts for at least 30% of all potable, drinkable water use as well. Advocates argue that standards for outdoor care should shift towards something less resource intensive and that fits better with each local habitat. I asked Nancy what she would suggest people do with their lawns. Here's what she told me in media. You absolutely have to test your soil. You're, you're shooting blind if you try and put anything on your lawn, you don't know what it is. When you test your soil, and we use the Yukon um, testing laboratory, um, University of Connecticut, it tells you if you need lime, if so, whether you need calcium lime, dolomitic lime, it tells you what nutrients you have and you don't have. And you've got to have the right balance to grow a healthy lawn. Testing is important and then adding what's needed to sort of get the right balance. In Connecticut, you're not even allowed to add phosphorus fertilizer to your lawn unless your soil test says you need it. And that's what, you know, too much phosphorus is what's in too much nitrogen. That's what's causing all these ponds and lakes and streams to turn green. We don't need to do that. There's, there's alternatives. It, it's not hard to do. Next, let's talk about those pest-free shrubs. One reason the shrubs may be pest-free is because they are non-native. The USDA defines non-native plants as having been introduced with human help, intentionally or accidentally, to a new place or a new type of habitat where it was not previously found. Here's why that's a problem. Native insects co-evolved with native plants, and non-native plants do not host the same number of native insects, and birds feed their young only insects in the spring. So native plants in that regard uh, sort of complete the chain of life. What constitutes as native is obviously relative to one's location, but online tools such as the National Wildlife Federation's Native Plant Finder and local gardening centers can help. And the problem with some of them is that the state of Connecticut and other states in New England have been planting them along the side of the roads. They brought them in for a reason and then they became invasive. So now like Japanese honeysuckle, the beautiful white fragrant flowers that bloom in the summer at the beach, that will take over the world. That's an invasive, it's illegal to sell it. Back to our own example, people use pesticides and herbicides to try to cut down on the number of unwanted bugs and weeds but overuse of these can end up doing grave ecological harm. We sell ladybugs, we sell um, beneficial insects that either eat or parasitize the bad bugs. If you blanket spray your garden with a pesticide without targeting that pest at the proper time of day or night, 
and, and knowing exactly what you're spraying for. You kill the good bugs and the bad bugs. Then it's your job to provide protection for the rest of the life of the garden. Nancy was clear that the solution isn't to avoid using chemicals altogether, but rather to be more intentional and to avoid overuse. A, if they're going to use a product, we want it to be something that's safe. And then once they decide to use it and know what they're using it on, we want them to apply it targeted and at the right time of day. Not during the day, but in the evening after the pollinators have stopped flying. You know, if you, so it's not that every pesticide is good. We don't like to see, there's lots of very toxic pesticides. There's things like Roundup that now have been proven in the courts that they cause cancer. So we don't use Roundup, we don't sell Roundup, we have alternatives to this. We don't use some of these really toxic poison sprays, we have alternatives. Our alternatives are much safer to use, but they still will kill what you're targeting. So you have to use them with conscious care. All of this advice sounds good in theory, but are people in the United States really going to give up their perfectly manicured lawns over environmental concerns? Nancy, however, was optimistic. And sometimes it's because they see their grandchildren playing on the lawn, or they see their dog playing on the lawn, or their dog gets cancer, or something happens and they have this aha moment and they say, okay, I get it. I shouldn't, why am I doing this? Why have I been doing this? I bought into this. Why did I buy into it?